Hello and welcome to another episode of Willow Talk. Adam Peacock here with a, uh, well, we've rotated this week. We've got a changed <laughs> up lineup. Uh, Brad Haddon, Lisa Healy, not here. Producer Sam is in the studio with me. Sammy, how's things, mate? I'm excited today. Yes. <laughs> I can tell by the rundown that yeah. you've produced here. Yeah. There's a lot to ask our special guest, former Australia and England coach, Matthew Mott. Motty, how are you? Yeah, very good. Thanks. Great to be here. Great to see a familiar face in Sammy. He hasn't, <laughs> he hasn't got any shorter, that's for sure. Okay. So he knows all the, the stories. So familiar face. Yeah. I'm an unfamiliar face. Yeah. I've got questions from yep. outside looking in. So you're looking forward to this? Yeah, why not? It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be any worse than English media, so let's go there. <laughs> well, we'll give it a go, Monty. <laughs> we'll get it. How was that um, experience before we delve into everything we're going to delve in? But the the English press is unique. The Australian press asks some hard questions. Mm. Nah. Over here, yeah, nah. this side of the desk, when we're back in the day. But um, they come at it, it seems in a basball way. They just a front foot the whole way with the bat. Yeah, I think that was the that was the thing. And if I look back when I went through the interview process, uh, the outgoing CEO, Tony Harrison, asked me a question at the end and said, how do you think you're going to go with the English media? And I quite naively sort of said, oh, look, I think I'll be fine. You know, I've normally had a pretty good relationship and I'm pretty open and honest. I think, you know, if you keep that, normally you get respected. But I felt over time that probably the more honest you were, the more you're a bit of a sitting duck. You know, you, you, you let out... I'm probably an overshare of stuff at times. Um, and I'd learnt over time that, you know, you had to control your messages, um, mm. you know, definitely tailor it back and give the facts and as much as you can. But, um, yeah, I mean, what I found is they're generally pretty decent blokes, but if they had a story, they just all ran with it and mm. it became a real pack mentality. Um, and you did feel like you were a pretty lonely spot up there in front of all of them having a crack. That's how the press box, roll, press box rolls, isn't it, Sammy? My word. I mean, over there, um, the lows are very low and the highs aren't even that high. So, <laughs> so <laughs> Although his time with Aussie coach, Australia coach, yeah. they never lost. No. Well, that's not true. Well, you well, lost it. So I only lost my job World after Cup. the first year and a half. We, uh, we lost it you know, in 2017, that World Cup. Yeah. So, um, Australia wasn't used to losing much back then either, but, um, yeah, no, we, we definitely had some lows with the Australian team, but I mm. think that those, those actually galvanized the group, um, you mm. know, particularly Meg and Rach as leaders. I think that gave us a path forward, but, um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, I mean, we had some great times in England as well. We won a world cup in Australia. Um, yeah. and I don't think the last T20 world cup was that bad either. I mean, we had a few things against us, yeah. um, our preparation going into it was, was awful. Um, and we got to a semi final and. Got beaten by India, a pretty good team. Yeah, and that uh, tournament was set up for India, wasn't it? A little bit. <laughs> never happened we before, never happened since, has it? We didn't say it? that, we didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, let's get into uh, what we're going to talk about today's rundown. We'll chat to Motti about his time as a player and coach, and you've got some old stories as well, like uh, um, Sammy's pointed out one about Alan Border. Looking forward to getting to <laughs> that one a bit later on. Your good mate Simo will, will um, tell some tales about him and, and heels and hads, I mean, it's the Australian way when someone's not in the room to defend themselves, yeah. it's time to tip shit on them. So yeah. I, I think want... there's a reason they're not here, actually. <laughs> I want some yards it's on those time two. for a bit of payback. Today, <laughs> you know them well. Uh, we'll touch on the, the Melbourne Renegades maiden WBBL title. It's weird seeing a team in red win, the, uh, <laughs> win a BBL title or WBBL title, but well done to them. Uh, the rain, um, and unfortunately... Didn't go Brisbane Heat's way. And of course, all the latest on the Border Gavaskar Trophy and the lead up to the second test in Adelaide. Now, before we get into it, uh, Sammy, we've got some lots of feedback on the Willow Talk trucker hats. Yeah, lots of feedback, lots of positive feedback. Mm. People messaging not only us on Instagram and TikTok, follow us at Willow Talk Podcast. Also, Swiv's Locker, who did a great job mocking up the hats. So they've been in touch and there's a, a whole range coming soon. So a range. A range. So not just trucker hats. Not just trucker hats. Bucker hats. Ex- bucket hats for bu- people with oblong heads like Trucker myself. hats. We've got bucker <laughs> hats. We've got, we got all kinds of hats. Um, Beauty. Yeah. So they'll be coming uh, before the end of the year and then look to formalize something earlier in the new year. But exciting times. Marty, last week when last week's episode dropped, within, oh, I would say six hours, I had five family members or mates say, 
Hands up. Hands yes, up. please. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm in the market as well. So <laughs> yeah. I think you noticed I've shaved my lid yeah. and uh, I've become a connoisseur of good hats these days. So I noticed Hads is not here. I was going to hit him up for a few. He, he seems to sport a few, a few good ones. He's, He's a got a whole spare. museum of drug <laughs> hats, that bloke. And guys, on a serious note, before we really get going, uh, the passing of Ian Redpath, who died on Sunday, age 83. Now, Ian played 66 tests for Australia between 1964 and 1976, scoring eight centuries, played five one days, including the very first one day at the MCG in 1971. He was described by Greg Chappell as someone who might kill to get a place in the Australian team. That's the way things were back then. Ian was a proud Victorian, played 64 first-class matches at the MCG, the most by any player, and was inducted into the Australian Cricket Hall of Fame last year. And um, until the very end, loved his cricket, uh, was was held in great esteem, obviously, in Victoria and in Geelong, where he was a, a local hero down there. Yeah, that's right. Coach Victoria. Um, I remember I was reading a, a story about him, how he went back to World Series cricket, came in, and that was his superannuation. He <laughs> called it, cashed in after a couple of lean years with Australia and uh, he was batting with David Hooks and Hooks is at the other end saying, what are you doing out here, mate? Get back to the antique shop. <laughs> You're too old to be here. What do you, did you have anything to do with him in Victoria? I did. And when you say a legend of Geelong, I, I played club cricket down there for Frankston Peninsula. And uh, whenever you went along there, you saw him and he always made an effort to come and say hello to you. Um, Jason Backer, who was a good mate of mine, had a lot to do with him and they just revered him. Yep. You know, when you talk about the level he played, but what he did for that club, he was in and around. He was in everything. He was on committees and stuff like that. Yeah, just a lovely, lovely man. Mm. Rest in peace and uh, thoughts with his family. Um, and obviously he would have watched the first test and didn't quite go Australia's way. Let's now look ahead to the second test. And, and Sammy, there's been changes left, right and centre. So Josh Hayeswood out. Sean Abbott, Brendan Doggett have been added. That wasn't on the bingo card <laughs> at the start. Maybe Sean Abbott, but Brendan Doggett, interesting. Bo Webster, friend of the show, yep. obviously added to the squad as cover for Mitch Marsh. Um, Brendan Doggett's path is an interesting one, to yeah. say the least. Pretty wild. He came into the Australia A squad where he took 6 for 15, a career best haul, but he was an injury replacement for Liam Hatcher, who was an injury replacement for Mark Steckity. Wow. So talk about grabbing your chance with both hands. Uh, fast bowler, uh, bowls some really nice short stuff. So if he does get a crack, I reckon you'd see mm. that kind of mm. um, mentality out of, of Doggett. But um, yeah, we're testing the depth of Australian cricket at the moment. Well, at the very least, it sounds like he's going to be a fun guy for the net. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for yeah, the guys to face. But Josh Hazelwood, Moddy. So no Hazelwood, who we know we've seen perform against India in the best way possible at Adelaide Oval not that long ago. Know him in the attack. How does that twist how you use your attack? Yeah, well, you take a world class. And, and I think... Yeah, it's fair enough to say Josh is one of the greats of Australian cricket, really. Mm. Um, you know, he is Mr. Dependable. He can take wickets up front. He can bowl the donkey overs if you need to. Like, mm. So uh, he's a captain's dream. But I think someone like Boland can cover that. I think he's shown when he's come in, he's done really well. I think the length that he bowls will really suit Adelaide. Um, mm. He had a good crack at the Indians last night um, and bowl well. But I think um, he'll take a lot out of that as well. So mm. I, I think... They have got good replacements. I think Australia's got some really good cover in the quicks if they need it. Um, but they've had to wait a long time for their opportunity. So, um, you know, I, th I feel for someone like Nessa as well. who has yeah. been in and around. I think he would have been a handful in Adelaide. Um, but luck and timing play such a part, don't they, in, in your selection. Mm. So uh, whoever gets that crack, uh, it's a good opportunity because that team will be very hungry after, you know, the first test. And they've had time to lick their wounds a bit. They'll come out really fresh and firing. Mm. The rain stuffed up that game, didn't it, Sammy and, yeah. and Moddy in, in Canberra? It was meant to be a two-day. ended up being a 50-over a one-dayer. Um, each squad had about 33 players on their list, so they could <laughs> sub in, sub out. So it wasn't a real game of cricket. Scott Boland was part of that. But interesting to note, Shubman Gill was yeah. there, and he uh, – he, was so good that he didn't even get out. He just decided to yeah. walk off after 50. So, yeah. yeah. Same as K.O. Rahul. What do you get? Mid 20s. He just said, oh, hard enough. I'm, enough. I'm seeing him pretty well. Moddy, you were down there. What were some of your takeaways from that game? Yeah. Look, I thought India um, really took the game quite seriously. I think there's, there's always potential for those games to sort of drift on. Um, but you know, they, they won the toss, decided to bat under lights, which we thought they would do. Mm. Um, and, you know, apart from Rowett, I think they all got something out of it. You know, I, I don't think it was about going out there and getting a hundred. It was about, you know, spending some time in the middle, just getting accustomed to the pink ball. Um, but it was great to see young Sam Constance go out there yeah. and get a hundred. That was quite pleasing. And, and the fact that he 
you know, he started quite well against the moving ball and then they lost a lot of wickets in, in the clump in the middle there. And he showed a lot of character and sort of maturity to come out and then whacked them at the back end. So that yeah. was, that was pretty fun to watch. What do you see with him? Do you see a, a future test cricketer in a while, or do you see someone who if needed in this series could be called upon? Yeah, it's a big, big call. I think, um, I think he's got the game. Like he, he navigated some tricky stuff yesterday and it was a pink ball nibbling around, um, showed a solid technique and he showed what you'd hope from a solid opening battery. So he showed the ability to hit down the ground. I mean, he did remind me a bit of Shane Watson, the way he played and obviously Ooh. they've spent a bit of time yeah. together. Um, but even some of the wax he hit over mid wicket was a bit what I like more in his mm. T20 game. Um, so it's always a good sign when someone reminds you of a, of a very good player. Um, but you know, time will tell. I, I think um, I think he's definitely an opener. He looks like he looks like an opener. And so, if there's an opportunity down the track, I, I don't think he'd do himself any harm. This all rounder thing, mm. Sam. It's like I don't know if we're reading too much into it, but Mitch Marsh, we understand, is not a hundred percent. So whether or not he can get his twelve, fifteen uh, overs with the ball, if required, remains to be seen. But Big Bowie, who we had on, and he was like, "Oh yeah, if." If George Bailey is going to give me a call, I'll I'll certainly have a chat to him, my fellow Taswegian. It's worked out to him so far. Uh, worked out for him so far, and he stuffed up Hads's week last week by yeah. ending that game at the SCG pretty well in the Shield. He did, he did. I guess this comes down to Australia's philosophy of picking the top six batters in the country, the best six. And Mitch Marsh is in there on his batting. Do they need that fifth bowling option? And if that's the case, where is Mitch Marsh in that top six? Is he the sixth best in the country? If he's not, that means someone goes out of the team. If they need to play, Bo Webb's the all-rounder. And who's that? Is it the new guy, McSweeney? Is it Marnus who's struggling a little bit? You wouldn't drop Travis Hedder in his home soil. You wouldn't drop Usman Khawaja. Certainly not dropping Steve Smith. So that's a big question for the selectors, Motti. It is. And I think, you know, you have to get out, out to Adelaide, have a look at the conditions as well. And, and if, you know, if it is going to be a game, which was like there last time, which mm. was over in two and a half days, yeah. that will influence your selections. You know, if it's going to be a fast moving game, which there's every likelihood it could be, that will always affect the balance that you end up going with. But, um, yeah, that, I think that philosophy on picking your best six batters is a, is a given against a quality attack like India. It was going to be hot in Adelaide throughout the rest of the week, I think one of the days, I think the day before the test scheduled 38 degrees, maybe cooling off for the first couple of days. So I don't know if that'll play a part in conditions as well. Just that I can't get my head around the whole, do you need to come out and say, this is our philosophy? Like this is our locked in philosophy, best six batters in Australia, and then we'll shuffle them around anyway. Do you need to come out and say that as a group? No, not necessarily, but I think you have it in the back of your mind. Um, but there's always different nuances of wherever you play around the world, you know, wickets might yeah. spin, you, you might, there might be even things like the, the rain might be around so you know that you're going to lose play. So mm. there's always options that you have to keep up your sleeve. And I think you do put a rope around your neck a little bit when you say, this is the only way we're going to pick the team. There's always a bit of give and take in any selection. Um, so yeah, you, you do, you do sort of hold yourself to ransom a little bit if you make a blanket statement, but I, I think most teams generally look to play their best six batters. Cause yeah. that feels like it gives Jerno's ammo. <laughs> when it doesn't look like it's going well, yeah. Sammy, and it's like, well, you're saying you're picking the best six. To me, on the outside at the moment, it looks like Josh Inglis is one of those six. Yeah, yeah. The way he started the summer. So, if I was the English press right now, I'd Ooh. be eating this up. No, <laughs> I, it's interesting. When you were selecting teams, Marty, um, you know, for England and for Australia and all the teams you've been in, you talked about the nuance there. What what else goes into it besides the raw numbers? Like, how much is character? How much is on? fitting in with the team, the conditions, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The, the intangibles are always there. I think, yeah. you know, to you, to your question there, I think a lot of the time, particularly like, say you're picking a world cup squad, mm. you've got a rough idea of your best 12 players. Right. And then yeah, you know, the th extra three, a lot of that is on that other stuff, the outside team stuff. Are they good around the group? Do they add energy to the, the group when they're not playing? All those sort of things are factored in mm. and they're thrown around and, I think everyone thinks um, in selection, you know, it, it's just Andrew McDonald or it's, you know, just George Bailey. You know, conversations are going on in and around the nets every day. You know, you sit, you have coffee, you might have a beer one night and talk about this stuff. And it's thrown around a lot. Um, yes, yes, you've got the analysts giving you the raw numbers, but that's just a guide. And I think a lot of it is, you know, watching training, seeing who's looks in a good space on those 50-50 calls. Mm. You know, that intel from the captain, the coach and senior players is absolutely vital in that you know, that last decision.
because it's essentially 10 players usually pick themselves yeah. and you're agonizing over that last selection a lot. And quite often like the press make that such a big thing, mm. uh, but it's not, you yeah. know, it's the performance of the other 10 that's probably more important. Have you ever been swayed by a, a beer at a bar the night before a game <laughs> going, you know what, if, I'll get him in. No, no, I haven't. No, I haven't. I don't drink, mate. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Only in days that end in Y. <laughs> Marnus. So let's get to Marnus. Um, unfortunately for Marnus, he's scratching around for form like a drunk man scratches around to find his house keys in a dimly lit porch at the moment. It, it, it's just, I, I feel for him because he's he's so much better than that and you, you want him to come good, um, loves his cricket, loves the Australian cricket team, but at the moment it's not happening for him. How do you approach that? Take us to your, have your, one of your coaches trucker hats on. <laughs> <laughs> Take us to the coaching perspective of, okay, there is so much noise outside about this guy's hopeless, he shouldn't be in the team, all of that. Everyone's having an opinion because it's an Australian summer, that's what we do. How is it happening inside the four walls about how this is being approached? You're tiptoeing around things. You're having heart to hearts. You're not mentioning it. What what happens? Oh, you're definitely mentioning it. You know, Manus Manus is a is a guy who leverages off a lot of people. You know, he'll ask a lot of opinions. Obviously, he's got some confidants within that team. He's very close with Steve Smith. He'll be asking him a lot of stuff. But I don't think that's changed whether he's in or out of form. And I, I think the thing to remember with Manus, he's been a pretty good servant of Australian cricket over a long period of time, and it's his time to miss out for a bit. And, and that's hard and, and you've got to go through that. But what will happen is if he emerges from this little slump, what, what he will do is make up for it well and truly. And he's shown that over a long career that he can do that. Um, and what I would be suggesting to him is, is going back to some really good footage of what he's done in the past. And I don't think it's that different. You know, like he's had a, a technique that has, you know, has challenged convention quite a bit, I think, and, you know, polarized opinion, but he's made it work for him. And just because it's not working, it's not a time to just try and throw everything out and, and start again. So little tinkering, which he always does anyway, um, spending some time in the middle mm -hmm. is gold dust. But that's spare time around the camp. So you're in the nets, or oh, Marnus is an extreme example, like Steve Smith, maybe he's in the nets about eight and a half hours a day or something like that. No, but <laughs> in all seriousness, he goes to training for two hours, he comes around. The rest of the day, he's got 16 hours of waking time, perhaps, to think, how do you as a, as a leader in the group, kind of get him away from that or you just leave him and he can work it out because he's a, a mature player and human being. Yeah. Every individual is very different. So you'll have a different strategy for each one. I, for Manus, I would be getting him to try and talk less about the cricket, maybe take him out for a game of golf. He loves his golf at the moment. Um, he's got a horrible slice, um, but <laughs> go you know, well for he, him then, huh? <laughs> if he can get, if he can get that right, he hits a long ball, um, and get him just talking about different things, trying to get him, you know, out to dinner and talk about something other than cricket, because uh, I think this, that's why these guys and they get a lot of grief for playing a lot of golf. It's one place where you have a sanctuary for four hours where there's mm -hmm. no media. You've got your mates around you, you're talking, you can talk about whatever you want, um, and put away the pressures of international cricket for a while because it's mm -hmm. always there. And, you know, if you look at it, it's not just, Mar like, who'll be next? Mm -hmm. Who's, if Manus peels off 100 in Adelaide, you know, it goes back to normal, then, then it'll be someone else in the gun. Um, and I think that's, that's why it's called test cricket. It's yeah. bloody hard work. Yeah. And you can see with Manus, I mean, it's, it's mindset, isn't it? Heels and Hads have talked about intent. You get two or 52 balls. You can't tell me there's not one of those 50 balls that he could have played a scoring shot against, right? He was looking to defend, leave, and get through the tough stuff. But how do you say go out there and play more attacking shots when he thinks every ball's a hand grenade? Yeah, and it, that's it. And it, and that's that confidence only comes with scoring runs. But um, yeah, like he he's he's a sort of guy. I feel like if he gets you know peels off a couple of cover drives in a row, mm. he'll almost come down and swagger down and go <laughs> back, come back, baby, that sort of thing. Yeah. So it's not that far away. But at the moment, it probably feels like a lifetime ago since he's been in that sort of mindset. Um, and I don't think, I don't know, there's no, there's no silver bullet to just come and go, mate, you should be right. You like, know, he's got a lot of good people around him, giving him a lot of good advice, but it's the little voice in the ear saying, come on, mate, like mm. your own voice in there. That's the thing you have to conquer. And, um, that fear of failure is, is that the single hardest thing for a batsman you know, playing cricket. And once you can overcome that and you know, that, that ear gets noisier than the other ear, you've got a chance of scoring runs. Hopefully it doesn't get this. Uh, to this for Manus, hopefully he comes up with some runs in Adelaide, but say it does, 
how is it the worst thing in coaching to have to tell a player, look, we're dropping you. You're, you're stepping out of the team for now. I mean, you've had to do it with the all-conquering Australian women's team a few times with very good players. Is that the worst thing about a role like yours or you just leave it to the selector and they can make that phone call? I tell you, it's, it's a funny one. I think it's harder to leave players out and to talk to players when they're going well. Now, if someone's going really well and then, you know, for instance, a player's been out injured and they come back and they get squeezed out, that, that's hard. Those conversations are really hard. I find the ones with players that are struggling actually a lot easier. Mm. And I, I was probably the most dropped shield player of all time. So I know how to give a message about what being dropped. What's the dropped. nicest way you ever got dropped? Like Sean Graff, I reckon he goes, you're out. <laughs> and it, it saved all the buggerizing around, you know, like you, you sit, sort of sit there and that's what I've learned is, that, you know, players know when they're under the pump, you know, yeah. when the ax is on the shoulder. Um, and you just want someone to, first of all, deliver it in a decent mm. way, give you a path back, like mm. say what you need to do to get back, you know, do it with a bit of compassion and empathy, but also just tell you the truth. And I think mm. once you get that, you might not agree with the decision and you might think you deserve one more game, but eventually you come back and you respect that. And I've always found with players, you know, that you've, you've had to leave out that a drop. Sometimes it's a relief, you know, mm. sometimes it, you know, the pressure of, you know, that, that hanging over their head for so long and not being able to find a way out, they find as a relief. And then they can go away, work on their game and build a game that's going to mm. be better next time. So I think there's a real history of that in the Australian cricket team. Yeah, yeah. I remember one call you made in the 2017 Ashes at North Sydney Oval, the pink ball game there, and all the talk was um, Ash Gardner was going to make a debut and you didn't pick her in the end. Um, can you talk us through that and and – what it was like leaving someone like a, of Ash and, you know, what she's become, uh, leaving her out of that team. Yeah, it was hard. Um, you know, and all the talk and all the build up into yeah. that was Ash was going to make a debut and how special it was going to be. Uh, I think she did a lot of interviews as well. Yeah. Uh, we had another one with Georgia Wareham in, um, in the ashes over in England as well. And, and that's, that's a hard, that, those, those were probably the hardest in the women's team. Yeah. Uh, you know, dropping someone from an ODI or a T20, uh, it was tough, but a test match, which comes around so infrequently, yeah. uh, you, it was heartbreaking. Those were, I remember, um, both of those, you know, those players who are tough players as well and quite resilient, you know, being really disappointed. Um, and, but they all responded really well and they realized they, they weren't missing out to mugs either. And they were yeah. missing out for the right reasons. And yeah, you know, we spoke around the reasons why we needed, um, leg spinner in that game, as opposed to some off spinners, the matchups that we had. The fact that the wicket was going to be pretty flat as well. Yeah. We needed a bit of extra turn. Yeah. Well, we'll talk more uh, to Monty about his, his coaching methods and his experiences in cricket in a sec and the whole England thing and also the Australian women's cricket team. I've got some messages here from um, Midge from the north of Sydney about <laughs> um, thing. It's just some listener questions. I don't know <laughs> who they're from. But, uh, Sammy, the WBBL final on Sunday at the MCG. A bit of rain about, unfortunately, um, mm -hmm. at the MCG, which made it tough for Brisbane Heat to get into the game after they started their innings on the back foot. But overall, Melbourne Renegades came up with a, a performance worthy of becoming champions. Yeah, absolutely. They finished the, the regular season on top of the table, got to host the final MCG. How good was it to see a big game at the MCG, not at Junction or, yeah. or at Docklands or something like that? But uh, that was great. And uh, Hayley Matthews, the import there, missed the first game. They, they let her have the first game off after a pretty taxing international yeah. season. And she's come back and repaid them with 69 or 61 and, and two wickets, two clutch wickets in the final. So the Renegades last, last season, outhouse to penthouse. What a story. And there's that whole stuff about Josie Dooley. She suffered a, a stroke while she was on holiday in Hawaii back in May. I think it was 230 days or so from that happening to them winning the title. Everyone got a little bit of emotional. Simon Helmut, yeah, bring, holding back the tears. It was a great story. One mm. of the, one of the great stories. They had her um, they had her jersey up in the locker room, the change room. Oh great. Uh, Dooley three, and they said, "Give us a message," and the message was, "Don't f it up," <laughs> and they didn't f it up. So, uh, are you going to go back outside after this and put the that beep, beep in there? Yeah, 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 we'll, yeah, put yeah. The, we'll put the beeps in. But you got to say it. You got to say it. But uh, Monty, you, you've yeah, obviously done heaps for the women's game. Yeah. Um, how good is it to see the Renegades and a new champion? I always like seeing new champions in yeah. these competitions. 
I'll get to that. But the first thing on the Josie Dooley, like, you know, growing up in Queensland, played against her old man in, in club cricket. Yeah. Uh, big sledger, actually, old man. <laughs> really? Yeah. He <laughs> called me one of Roddy's robots from the academy. And, right. Uh, yeah. So uh, he's a great man. Though. When I heard that story, I, I, I hadn't heard about it for the first month, but I was completely shocked. And, yeah. you know, he's kept me uh, in, you know, in the loop with all the things that have been going on. What an amazing comeback and story. And, you know, as a parent, it's your worst nightmare. Oh. So, um, yeah, very happy for her and the Renegades. Extremely happy for Simon Helmet. He's yeah. a guy I've spent a bit of time with over the years, and I think he's an outstanding coach. Um, and you could just tell they just love to play him for him. Some of the words Soph was talking about, you know, they'd run through brick walls for him. And, and you know, Soph herself, she's gone through a horror couple of years with injuries, yep. um, kept persevering, and to go out there. And she just looked like a great leader. I love the way she spoke after the match. Yeah. You know, she thanked everyone. She was incredibly grateful and um, just an outstanding role, role model. So, yeah, very happy for him. Yeah. DeAndre Dotton. Yeah. Um, that was the, 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 the only blip I'd say for the whole <laughs> Melbourne Renegades, although it has provided a highlight for social media. Um, I haven't seen a run out like that no. in a while. Uh, it was extra No one appealed. That was the amazing thing. So if you're listening to this, you haven't seen it. She basically like trundles through for a run, which is clearly there and gets to the crease and literally <laughs> jams the bat on the crease, not over the line in the line. It was like she was holding a, an epee, like she was fencing or something. It just got stuck in the ground and her body momentum didn't quite allow her to get her body over nah. the crease in time. And she was found by the third umpire to be, uh, well, literally not in her ground. Well, I yeah. thought it was amazing because she's one of the fastest runners in women's cricket. Yeah. And uh, I thought she actually did an injury the way she was. She looked very ginger before that. Um, it was a bizarre bit of cricket. Yeah. Stuart Broad commented on the video on Instagram. Yeah. And, like, what are you doing, Brody, commenting on this? He said, drop in pitch, always risky running off it. That's not unlucky. How's that not unlucky? Come on, Brody. Well, he'd know about luck. Yeah. <laughs> Love one to eight to slip. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, always bring that up. But extraordinary, yeah. Uh, good to know he's watching, though. Is, yeah. it a, is it a golden duck? I always thought. Diamond. diamond yeah, yeah, it's a diamond duck, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Some people were calling it a golden duck, but. Uh... Our, our friend Phoebe Litchfield of the show, Diamond Duck in a Test Match. I can't Mike Hussey ran me out in an uh, academy game. for it. I got a duck in the first innings and I didn't get to face a ball in the second. He no. ran me out. <laughs> it's the only tell. time I've kicked my helmet. I was Adelaide number two. Uh, Blocker Wilson got me out in the first. He's been a guest on your show. Mm -hmm. Got me out in the first innings. He was over the sight screen. I didn't even see it, LBW. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was backing up and then Huss has just absolutely sizzled me. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. And I, yeah, I had to kick. I, I had to make the walk back from Adelaide number two to Adelaide number one and the helmet didn't make the distance. So it's, <laughs> it's, the so river. It's, a, it's a low point in my batting career. That. He's a nice guy, Mr. Cricket, isn't he? But no, he's out there barbecuing his teammates, yeah. just trying to yeah. get ahead. Yeah. How how long did the sorries last for with someone like Mike, who was so nice? I think he got run. So what, yeah. he, he, was, he, <laughs> he, just, he just walked past me and then said, yeah, sorry, mate. Sorry. I think there was a run there or something. I think he said something like that. Yeah. yeah. What what about the WBBL money? You've seen it from its inception 10 years ago now. How have you seen that um, have an impact on the Australian women's team and not just them? Because it feels like the gap is getting closer between the international teams as well. Yeah, I just think this, um, the, the one word I'd say is the athleticism has improved out of sight. Yeah. You know, I think that we're getting the, a crop of really good young athletes coming through now. It's a visible game for young females to you know, to aspire towards playing for Australia. So uh, the, it's absolutely been critical, the WBBL. I think, um, you know, there's obviously been a lot of investment by Cricket Australia in other areas, but the, 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 there's nothing like seeing and, and being able to go to the ground. And you, said, you mentioned a couple of those grounds, like, you know, go to North Sydney Oval or Dremoyne and see your heroes out there playing and seeing them on TV as well. So uh, it's had a huge impact. Um, and you know, I think the, the rest of the world is, is, is seeing it and, and they're getting opportunities in the WBBL yeah playing in the Indian Premier League and stuff like that. So the world game is, is only going to go from strength to strength. We are off to a quick drinks break here on Willow Talk with our special guest, Matthew Mott. Back in a moment to talk about the England job, some old stories with ex-teammates such as Andrew Simons and Alan Border and why the Ivory Coast could be a possible destination for our guest today because <laughs> it looks like they need a coach. <laughs> Welcome back to Willow Talk with our special guest, Matthew Mott. And we're, we're going to talk coaching first and then playing. And I'm looking forward to the playing because you've got some <laughs> ripping yarns for us. But let's rip the Band-Aid off, shall we? The England job. So uh, you stood down, quote unquote, as England coach 
in July after the T20 World Cup. I'll be up front. Was it you jumped, you were pushed, or was it a jump push? Uh, where, where does it land in those three? Yeah, stood down. I didn't know that was that was one of the lines. But, um, yeah, no, definitely we came to an agreement. I, good mates with Rob Key. Um, yeah, clear. I think you got to track back the history. We Probably where it all went pear-shaped was the one-day World Cup in India, and we didn't play very well over there for a number of reasons, um, which we probably get into later if you want. But um, basically, we needed to do really well in that last T20, T20 World Cup. I actually thought we probably got a pass mark there. We, you know, we didn't have a great lead in. We got to a semi final and, and encountered India on a on a surface that really mm. suited them, um, and we did we didn't turn up on the day. I, I don't think we played as well as we could have, but um, it was always a tough ask. So, uh, you know, the silence was deafening there for a while after that World Cup. You know, mm. definitely, um, and it's quite unique. Obviously, being the white ball coach, and then you have a red ball coach, so you have a lot of time. We we're really busy and then quiet time. So I had a lot of time to reflect and I probably knew the writing was on the wall when I was going to catch up with Keezy. Um, and it, you, normally we catch up in London, but he was very insistent that he wanted to come to Cardiff. And, uh, at that point I thought, well, I oh. told my wife, I think, uh, <laughs> I think we might, might need to make some plans here. Um, and look, the conversation was really good. I, I said from the outset, I think I know why you're here. Let's just have a genuine conversation about what's going on and, and where you want to go. And, and, and it was a really good meeting. Um, and I, and I can't, I can't fault the ECB for the way that they've treated it since. Um, disappointed. I didn't get another crack at it. I think, you know, we obviously had a world cup win early, uh, mm. made a semi final and had one really bad world cup, but it's the nature of coaching. I, I don't bear a grudge at all. I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity first and foremost, and, uh, enjoyed my two years. Mm. So what happened in the 2023 world cup? <laughs> Uh, look, I thought we had a horrible lead in, um, you know, we, one of the things about coaching that team and I was probably a bit naive going into it, but very rarely did we get our best team together, you know? Mm. So we, we would roll through 60 players a year in terms of, you know, players coming in and out. So in, in terms of being able to create a structure and develop a culture, it was probably the trickiest I've ever encountered. Yeah. Um, you know, the test team probably goes through 15 or 16 players. You've got a lot of continuity. They always had a really good lead in as well. Like they'd go away for a week or two. Often players in our setup were arriving a day or two before the World Cup. Yeah. And, you know, you're trying to, you're trying to, it's hard enough, I think, being an international coach when, you know, halfway through most tours is where you need to really start like pulling people back in and getting their energy levels up. But yeah. quite often we were starting you know, fatigued and behind the eight ball. And that lead into there, we had a, a 42 hour round trip to get to Gawati in the, in, in the, back blocks of India yeah. and thank for that game got washed out. Then we traveled again and we got beaten by New Zealand in the first game, which is a bit of an upset, but they're, they're a good team. And then we'd never really recovered. And, uh, yeah, it, it was disappointing. We, we just, I couldn't believe we had so many good players that just didn't fire at the same time. Yeah. And yeah, they're trying so hard. The spirit was good within the group, but they, yeah, we just didn't, we didn't get it back. Yeah, uh, so at the T20 World Cup, lost to India by 68 runs in the semi. Just recapping for, to re revise history, if you like. Uh, 2023, one-day World Cup, 1-3, one, lost six, uh, finished seventh. Uh, T2022 World Cup, that's hard to say really quickly. <laughs> you won the thing. That's the yeah. main thing. Yeah. You won the thing. How was that experience and, and how much of a buzz did that give you, especially on Australian soil as well? Yeah, it was incredible. I think, um, you know, we had, we just had a amazing staff get together on there. We got Huss in, um, yeah. David Saker. So um, you forgave him after the running you out for a diamond duck. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It took, yeah, that's 20 years ago. Yeah. So. <laughs> Maybe 30 actually. Um, <laughs> Made him two, we paid him two grand for the month. So yeah. got him back. Funnily that enough, way, we yeah. got a reunion in Adelaide for the test match. We're all getting back together from that year of the academy and Huss is the only one not coming. So oh, uh, maybe, maybe there's something what? in it. Is he on the Fox cricket? Oh, no, he's not doing that test match. Rostered apparently. off. Yeah. Oh. Must be a family thing on. But uh, yeah, so um, where was I? Well, World uh, Cup. World Cup. Wow. Yeah, World Cup. Um, T20. Yeah, it was incredible. And that wasn't without drama as well. You know, we lost to Ireland um, and we were right. getting absolutely <laughs> smashed by the English press at that stage. Yeah. at the time. Yeah. And yeah, they didn't take it too kindly. <laughs> well, it was one of those things, yeah, because they brought in that rule where you can go out the 10th over um, yeah. to coach. And my philosophy on that is like, seriously, like, why, why would I go out there? Yeah. So I said to Joss, I said, look, mate, um, I'm not going to come out at the break. 
but if you need me, you know, sing out. As I said, I'll only come out if it's it's a nightmare or whatever. <laughs> I came out in the 10th <laughs> over that game. What's going on? You know, they were, they were belting us everywhere. I was like, what is going on here? So uh, we had a pretty candid discussion after that game and it was probably the, you know, the kick in the backside that we needed. And we played really good cricket. We got washed out against Australia, which, um, yeah, I was disappointed at the MCG, but um, it was a great final against Pakistan. Mm, it was just yeah. when we thought we had them, they, they come back and bowled extraordinarily well. Hey, just one thing on, on cricket coaching in general, you mentioned there that you came out and said what's going on and kind of changed things. I've always wondered with cricket and coaching, how much you, how much information you send out in the middle, because, you know, I go back to remember that one, Sammy, the, the Stokes innings at Lords yeah. where it was obvious what he was trying to do. He was just trying to load up on that short side yeah. and, and eventually they figured it out. But it was only after about an hour and 15 minutes of absolute pain from an Australian yeah, perspective. And 140 yeah. runs. So yeah. everyone's screaming at yeah. the television, change the plan, change the plan. Is that the same with coaching sometime? Can you actually change it or do you have to hold yourself because you want them to figure it out for themselves? Yeah, it is a little bit format based, like depending on the format, how much you would you know send out there. Um, generally speaking, the, the players, are, like uh, my way of coaching is that the coach is there to support the captain. You, you do a lot of the prep, a lot of the work beforehand. That's when you ask a lot of the questions about tactics and matchups and stuff like that. On the actual game day, you do take a back seat unless you see something really stick out like that, for example, it's very rare you send out a message. I, I, I don't know too many coaches who are running messages out too often. Occasionally you'll see the bowling coach down on the side there, mm -hmm. but that's more on an individual level. Um, but you, you, you've got to back the players, you know, to make those decisions and find their way out of those those situations. But a lot of it, you, you do feel a little bit helpless on the sidelines. Sometimes you can see what's happening. And what I found even just doing the commentary yesterday is, um, unless you've got like your monitors there and the coaching staff, the TV viewer actually has a better view of the game. <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of the times you're in the square leg boundary and stuff like that. So you're not actually getting the same intel. You're not getting the live stats as well. Um, you know, mm. a lot of it's before the game. And I think that's the next evolution of coaching is that it's more like you've got a director in there who's telling you, you know, right here, right now, that's there. And I know they tried it years ago with link ups to, yeah. you know, to captains out in the field, but most other sports are doing it in some way. And uh, you know, the, the captains are under, particularly in T20, are under so much time pressure these days. Yeah. Most of their job is about making sure they finish the overs on time. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh, well, on TV, that's why we're the experts, Sammy. Watching yeah. you <laughs> Can you take us inside the coach box? What what actually is in there that you like in terms of TV um, things you can get from the outside world? What's the setup there? Well, it depends on what you bring in. Like so, normally, like most grounds are only obligated to have a replay screen at the end of um, you know the where the players sit and yep. maybe one in the rooms. But you know, everyone takes their own setup with them. And one of the best things that have come in uh, Australia do it, and England do it now is that they've got um, iPads and that for the coaches yeah. to be sitting on there. So everyone will have their own lens on what they want to look at. It's not just getting the one replay. Yeah. So if you, you're the bowling coach and some bowling innings, you can go back three or four balls and look through some stuff, which has never sort of been done before. Mm. You can also tag that if you want and send it to players later. So that, that's that been a big thing in the last few years. But before then, you, you're literally like, you, you were dependent on where the ground was. And a lot of, yeah. I think a lot of the better coaches would find their way and come behind the wicket, mm. which is always the best view to, to get a good, good view of the ground. But quite often you're just stuck in the back box, deep square leg. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just before we move on with, with Joss, lots of talk about how he looked, um, unenergized by the end of that world cup and now McCollum's come in and had a chat with him and he seems up and about what, what was your read on his performance in that world cup and, and sort of where he's been the past 12 months? Yeah, Joss is just uh, as a guy like he he's quite intense and he um, he's thinking a lot of things and yeah. he often like gets surprised. Like, we used to joke about it. He's got a bad resting bitch face, you know. Like he's, <laughs> he's sitting there and he like you'd think you'd think he was like really angry and you talk to him, he's like, yeah, mate, yeah, and he's fine. <laughs> but he just he just had one of those, you know. Like my old, my yeah. son calls it the face of thunder. Like he, yeah. he'd say, oh, you've got the face of thunder. So, but. It's just unfortunate that it looks like that. And the yeah. way that the cameras are now, like literally, if you're the captain or the coach or whatever, like every time something goes bad, yeah. bang on you. So, um, I, I found him a great guy to deal with. Yeah. Um, he's, he's just an incredible player. Mm. Like I've, you know, I've seen a lot of great players, but in that format, like if you wanted someone to win a game that's unwinnable, he's one of your first picks. 
Ben Stokes. It seems he can't make his mind up if he's retired from white ball cricket playing for England or not. And whether or not he plays in the Champions Trophy remains to be seen. But can you tell us something about Ben Stokes that we might not ordinarily know? He's had more comebacks than Johnny Farnham, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he has got no idea who John Farnham is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> uh, no, no, another guy, like, it's just for, for me, it's body dependent with Stokesy. Um, he's just, he's your warrior. Like he's your bloke that they love playing for. All the boys love him. And, um, he's, your ta- he's just such a talisman. You know, like he, he his knees are, there's, he's bone on bone in his knees. He's mm. tough. He, you know, he's meant to bowl three overs of workload and he'll bowl 11 straight because mm. the team needs it. He's the guy that, yeah, you, know, you just want to play with. Um, and I think, you know, the, the best thing probably Australian would say about it, he's, he's like an Aussie, yeah. you know, like he, well, he's a Kiwi, yeah, so. he's a Kiwi, <laughs> close enough, close enough. but he's, uh, yeah, Don't he's, tell that actually. <laughs> he's, um, he, he loves seeing others do well as well. And that's so obvious. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he, you can't fake that stuff. And when, you know, when that's why the young guys come in in the side, I think they come in and do really well. Is because they feel like he's got their back straight mm-hmm. away. Um, he likes leading. He's like he's he's nowhere near the. I think for the perception of the outside, you think he's this brash sort of. He's a very softly spoken guy. Mm-hmm. Um, highly empathetic as well. Like loves. Yeah. yeah. If if someone's going through a rough trot, he's the one most likely to go up and say, "Yeah, you want to come out and play some golf, or you want to." Come and play paddle, or you know, he's yeah, he's a really good, strong leader as well. Cries in rom coms as well, and all of that. <laughs> I don't know. You're yeah. telling me, you're empathetic, just got a softer side. Yeah. So no, nah, it's oh, we've all got to play to him. Yeah, for, deep down, deep down. What about some of these young players coming through? Because like, it looks like baseball has morphed um, white ball cricket with red ball cricket, especially with the bat. Some of these these younger players that are like I look at a Harry Brook, even though he's not young, young. I go. Oh my God, if he's in and he's on, mm. how are you going to get him out? Even though they've dropped a few <laughs> against yeah. New Zealand, but yeah. like he, he then makes them pay and pay heavy. Is is he the one that could be something quite special or is it, there others underneath that you've seen in your time with the white ball team that are going to get their go in this baseball era? There are, there are a number of really good batters and I often say that. English cricket does set up well for, for batters because they get so many opportunities to bat. You know, they play so much more cricket than Australian batters, particularly in white ball. You know, they just play, you know, four or five times a week if, you know, and mm. bat a lot. But Harry Brook to me is, he's a once in a generation player. Wow. Um, when I first saw him bat and I'd heard big raps on him, um, you know, my mates back home, oh, who's the best, who's the best player over there? And I said, Harry Brook, um, by, by street. Um, if you look at someone to play test match one day, T20 cricket, you know, all day, every day in different conditions. I think his game is, is as compact. And you mentioned there, like, how are you going to get him out? Once he's, he's got a air, once he gets in, like everyone can get out in the first 10 balls, but once he gets in, it looks like he's only going to get himself out. Um, ironically, he'd only made his first double hundred. Uh, his old man had had him covered for double hundreds, <laughs> which I found fascinating up until yeah. last year. And so he was so happy that he crossed his old man off when he got that double hundred. I just couldn't believe it because what he looks like the type of bloke once she once he gets a hundred, like yeah, you're going, oh, he, he's doubling it. I got a triple hundred, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's um, but he is incredibly talented player, and just as you talk about different techniques, there doesn't seem to be a lot that can go wrong with his technique. Mm. It's very simple. Uh, if I was a young kid and I was trying to copy someone, he'd be right at the top of the list. Mm. Mm. Interesting. I mean, he's the guy that can bat all kinds of tempo. England have just debuted Jacob Bethel, who averages 26 in first-class cr- cricket, hasn't made a test match first-class century. Um, first guy to do that since Mike Gunning, how many years ago? 40 years ago. Is there some kind of disconnect? If you hear the rumblings in English cricket that uh, your old sort of traditional grafter and grinder, who's got a body of work under him, who's paid for 10 years and got 30 centuries won't get a look in now because he can't score at six and over. Yeah. Do you feel, did you sense that at all when you're over there? Uh, look, I think, um, you know, the, the top team always, um, shows the way I think. And so if you've got a, a philosophy with your test team, it has to permeate through the rest of the system. Right now, um, England, I think have they've made a statement that that's the way they want to play cricket and they're prepared to, to lose, to win which has been a pretty much an Australian philosophy for a very long time, but yeah. you can see it's made a difference and it might, I don't think it's consistently worked yet. Um, mm. but at least there's a method that where players can aspire and actually say, well, if I want to be in that team, this is what I have to do. 
And I think one of the best things that they've done is um, under Rob Keys, they've tried some different stuff, you know, bought in the Kookaburra ball yeah. in the middle of the season. The counties didn't like it, but the agenda was we need to find more fast bowlers and more spinners. Yeah. So if you, in the, and if they start playing more and more of those games, you're going to have to start looking for different talent because there's a very, just because of the conditions, a very different style of player that does well in county cricket yeah. as opposed to the international arena. Wickets are flatter. You've got to get ball speed. You've got to get trajectory as bowlers. So it's a very different ball game. Just before we move on as well, with the English cricket scene, um, the ECB run run things, but they don't really have control over the counties, do they? Because mm. it's very much split. Now, there, there was a little bit of that back here. It felt like in the last week with the Adam Zampa New yes. South Wales situation that Hads and Heels chimed in on and, and made some <laughs> print uh, quote <laughs> quotes. But the fact that, Cricket Australia tried to tell New South Wales what to do, but then New South Wales said, well, the communication, I don't know where the truth lied in the whole Adam Zampa situation, but over in England, does that hold English cricket back? Having that seemingly uh, like a little bit of disconnect between county and the national body? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think those discussions always go on. Um, and they've been going on f forever and a day. I mean, there was times when I was playing and guys were like, you know, 12th man for Victoria and then playing in the test side and stuff. So those things happen. Yeah. Um, but that, to me, that's just a communication thing. And, um, I, I think one of the best things Australia does well is it really incentivizes states to produce Australian pay, players. I don't think that's exactly the same in English cricket. I think there's, you know, there's a mentality of wanting to do well within your county. Um, there are there's obviously counties that, uh, you know, produce a lot of players like Surrey and, Durham over the years have done that. Um, but I think for them, the, the way forward would be to really incentivize that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And so then you get a different style of player that, you know, you're promoting, um, you might, and you might not go for a certain style of player that's effective mm -hmm. in county cricket because you want them to, to make that next step up the, up the ladder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it, the ECB are bringing in a uh, cookabara for four more rounds next year. Yeah. So doing it again and look at the fast bowls they've produced. Probably not from that, but, you know, Atkinson, Cass, they've got Wood, Archer. I mean, they've got a fair battery now. So next year's Ashes is going to be pretty spicy. It's definitely like, I, I think it was, it's a masterstroke to be honest, because it, 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 if nothing else, it, it just sort of disrupts and just, yeah. you can't just do the same, same, oh, we've got, oh, we've got to do this. And yeah, you've got to think differently to do that. How are we going to get it? Well, we need, you know, we need some ball speed or we need to produce some wickets that maybe turn a little bit or, you know, bounce a bit more. So I think it's great for the game. Mm. And the, the, the beauty of the, the county season is 18 games. Yeah. So you can actually muck around with a little bit. It's probably harder in shield cricket where you, mm. you don't get as many opportunities to do that. Mm. Favorite memory of your, your time with the Australian women's team where you had oh. some great success. And then as you mentioned at the top there, you had, yeah. like, it wasn't all rosy, but yeah. it was pretty much a shade of rose. Yeah. I mean, it's always hard. It's like picking your favorite child, isn't it? That's the thing. What's that? Crimson, magenta? What is well, it? No, roses are with? different colors. What am I saying? Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I think everyone always says, oh, what was your favorite World Cup? Well, the first one in the West Indies, you know, if we didn't have that, I might not have been in a job. So I'll have to, I'll have to take that. <laughs> and after 2017, for all of us, that was a, that was the gorilla off the back, basically. Um, yeah. I was especially pleased for Meg. Um, you know, she... She and I endured quite a bit after 2017 and, you know, it felt like a bit of, you know, retribution. Um, and then if you, if I had to pick one, the, being in the dressing rooms after winning the World Cup in Melbourne, mm -hmm. um, T20 World Cup, um, you know, Katy Perry playing in the background, family around. We had, our dressing room was full of family. Like, oh, yeah. And they're big dressing rooms, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. That was pretty special. Um and then when I sort of knew I was going, we had the last one in, in, um, in New Zealand and that was after COVID and all the stuff that was going on there. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a great way. If I knew that night I was, I was leaving, I, 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 I you know, just had that gut feel I was going to go. So that was special as well. Mm. Oh, you, you made heels that night. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? 170 odd, 170 odd, oh, like 12 balls. Yeah. It was funny. Cause, um, she used to bat seven, eight, uh, when I first took over and, um, Timmy Coyle was the one who kept, he got open with her, you got to open with her. And yeah, you know, we finally gave her a chance and she bombed a few down long off stroke, but we persevered. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, she, she, well, on one night when she probably had a couple too many beers, she said, you should have done this years ago. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's yeah. a, uh, there's a different heels, is there? Oh yeah. Oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> should we do one of those podcasts where oh. we... 
Yeah, might All be right, on a go. different uh, time slot. <laughs> 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 no, I, I got a message from Hills, who's off um, rehabbing and, and getting set for her, her next batch of cricket. Uh, so couldn't make it today. I don't know if she planned that properly. I think she might have. <laughs> <laughs> she has. Uh, he's a great man manager. He and Rach basically ran the team side of things and let Meg do her thing as captain, best batter in the world. Those three work so well together. But yeah, from a coaching perspective, he kind of unlocked the enjoyment factor for everyone again. All of a sudden, trainings weren't compulsory, but you weren't judged if you didn't go. People had role clarity and purpose and a fresh way to think about the game. Um, she went on to say, we butted heads a lot, but we'd go and have a round of golf and for four hours, we'd uh, connect again through that. We're both quite stubborn. There yeah. you go. Yeah. She always said I was stubborn and uh, my wife says that as well, but, um, <laughs> uh, the golf one was an interesting one because, um, I'd always want to be her partner. Um, and, and the reason was cause she got the hit off the red tees, which are 50 meters in front and she hit it further than me anyway. <laughs> so we used to play this, we used to play this game, uh, like a two ball Ambrose. So you play the best ball. Yeah. Uh, everyone was envious when, when you got, when you got Midge, cause you're up near the green <laughs> yeah. chipping and they're all back, back about 50 meters further. So yeah, a great golf partner. And you know, like I, she said, we butted heads. We, we, we did, but I, one of my philosophies on, on coaching and life is surround yourself with people that disagree, but aren't disagreeable. Mm. And what she did, she, if she didn't think what you were saying was right, she wouldn't sit on it. You know, mm. she'd, she'd call it out. And I, I really loved that and respected that about her. Um, and she, she didn't hold a grudge about it either. If you, you know, if you came back at her with a good enough you know, argument, um, that yeah, you'd get away with it. I do remember one bollocking she did give me though. Um, <laughs> we were at a, when we were in COVID and we we're all sort of hustled in these one rooms. I, you know, we, we were allowed to cut the beers and whatever. And I went to, I went to the toilet and then come back and I forgot to put the toilet seat down, didn't I? Oh. And I copped an almighty spray from him. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to justify. I said, well, I want it up. You want it down. Like, yeah, move yeah. on. And, uh, yeah, right. she, she didn't talk to me for a few days in, in COVID there. <laughs> what were you doing sharing toilets in COVID? That's what I want to know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were all in the bubble, weren't we? Yeah, yeah, of course. I remember going to a few trainings, Moddy, and you would punish the whole team if a bowler would bowl. Was it a no ball yeah. or an extra or something? Yeah. Can you explain what that was like? Uh, yeah, we, at the time we were just leaking a lot of extras and, um, uh, it was all about, you know, putting something on it, you know, not yeah. just, oh, I went down Lakeside, who cares? And so we, yeah, we put it on there, but the funniest one with that was, uh, I think it was at, um, oh, it was one of the grounds up North. doesn't matter. Um, and Meg, who was trying to get into her bowling career at that stage, and <laughs> it was feet. very, very much in its infancy. Let's yeah. just say that <laughs> high pace, but not a lot of a radar on it. And, uh. <laughs> Yeah, I remember, I've never seen her so nervous in my life. And every time, because we blew a whistle as well. Yeah, so it was really right. sort of, and she'd scrape down and <laughs> blow the whistle. She, <laughs> I think they had to do 10 push ups yeah. or something like that. And poor old Meg, I reckon she accounted for about 100 push ups that day. <laughs> I think that was probably the start and the end of her bowling career. <laughs> Meg and Holly Furling, serial offenders that day, I reckon. Yeah, they were. Yeah. And uh, they, both of them didn't, didn't actually react that well to it. <laughs> Did you take that to England, the whistle? No, I didn't. No, no, it didn't. It didn't last long. No, I, think, <laughs> I think it was one of those it's very old school. Yeah, you yeah. think, thing you try and you go, oh, maybe. Did it? Did it get the result we wanted? <laughs> I think we still bowled a few wides next <laughs> game. Um, should we go to the old war stories? Yeah, let's do it. Um, Alan Border was skipper on your first class debut. Can you tell us about this experience for you? Yeah, uh, I was lucky enough, debuted with two of my best mates, Andrew Simons and Sean Flegler at the time. And uh, I think it was Australia A game. So we lost Hayden, Law and a couple of the big guns. And, and AB, who wasn't actually captain at the time, was made captain for the match. Um, and in, in great Queensland wisdom, they decided to room me and Roy with AB in the room. So we'd all heard all these stories about Captain Grumpy and all this sort of stuff and nervous as hell. Like, what's this going to be like? And mate, by day three, they're calling him Papa Smurf and uh, you know, <laughs> he's got the two little fellas running around with him. And he was an amazing guy for me. Um, you know, you built him up as such a hero. Um, and he's the most modest down to earth bloke that I've met. But a lot of the Queensland guys were still shit scared of him, you know, cause they remember him back 10 years ago when he was captain of Australia and he would admit, you know, like he, yeah. he, he had so much pressure on him and he was, he probably a different guy, but by the time he came back to play for Queensland, he was just playing for all the right reasons and he loved the game and he gave so much back. And I don't think there's any doubt that the Queensland had an amazing decade after he was there. 
that that was a big part of it. Mm. Mm. I mean, it's the same with Australian cricket, right? Yeah, yeah. He never gets anywhere near enough credit for for what he did for that team. Growing up, you know, we were getting belted in the eighties. Um, you know, we had a lot of players lost. Um, you know, bowling even his left arm wily spinners uh, getting wickets at the SCG. I, he was just a like a national hero back then, wasn't he? And I think he was exactly what everyone needed. Well, you look at now and you think, okay, we lose a test by three hundred runs to India, and it's a complete disaster. We were doing that game, especially yeah. when the West Indies came down here. I remember it clearly in the mid eighties. That's the first kind of memories of international cricket. We were getting belted yeah. every yeah. time. And it was like a, a miracle if we got close. Absolutely. And AB was like shag on a rock type yeah. situation when Kim yeah. Hughes stepped away. So the other thing yeah. that people don't really recognize is that back then we played the West Indies every second series. Yeah. So he's facing the best fast bowlers in the world and average 50 against them. Yeah, you know, like it is incredible yeah. record in a side. And he, I found, I, my recollection is that he was the guy that restored all the pride and got all the hardness back in that team. And then for me, someone like Shane Warne coming in when I was in high school, when cricket still wasn't cool hmm. was, you know, he was then, he, he got that bedrock and then he kicked the game forward. And that's probably where we are today. Hmm. Roy, Andrew Simons, great mate. If you've had a lot to do with his memorial, obviously when he, he passed away not that long ago. I mean, I, let's go down the best avenue, the the best of Roy. Something <laughs> that stands out for you about, which kind of sums him up and you, you makes you smile to this day. I think there's a few that have immediately popped into yeah. your head because of the big grin on your face. Oh, mate, you speak to anyone from Queensland cricket, you could write it like a Encyclopedia Britannica on Roy. <laughs> there's that many stories. Um, not all suitable for here, but... Um, yeah, Let's just a, first of all, well, just an amazing bloke. You know, the first yeah. time I met him, um, one funny little story of when he was a junior cricketer, uh, he was a year or two younger than me and there was a guy, Les Ferguson, who's just passed away. He's a great man. Um, and Roy made 98, 60 and three in this competition, but didn't make the rep side. And, uh, I said to Les, I said, mate, why isn't Roy? Like he's the best player in the, the age group. Why isn't he in the team? He goes, well, he can bat, but he's, he's ordinary in the field. <laughs> I think, I think awesome. Les might have regretted that. He, back then he did let a, a few go through his legs. He, he was probably away with the fairies a bit and he didn't, he wasn't the fielder he was, but yeah, it was not the reason to leave, leave him out of his side. That's for sure. But I think Les might have regretted that. Socially after a win, what was he like for your beloved Queensland? Oh, he's incredible. Like he was literally the life of the party. And you know, like if someone wasn't getting into it enough, he'd go over there and terrorize them and like flick beer in their eyes, something like that. There's, you know, there's so many stories about that, but, uh, one of the, one of the, one of the ones, um, early days and people who know Roy, he, um, he wasn't the most intellectual bloke and even his mum admitted that, but, um, I remember uh, somehow or other when, when the internet first started, an email came through and it was Roy at Aussie mail. And he, uh, you know, like, um, this is too good to be true. So I sent him an email and said, G'day mate, how you going? I think I was at the cricket academy at the time. Like, how's everything going? Like, didn't hear anything back for months. So I finally caught up with him. I said, Roy, I, you know, I sent you an email. Like, did you get it? Did you get it? He goes, yeah, I did. I did. He goes, but you didn't put a returned address on your dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what about the reply button? <laughs> oh, you didn't tell me about that. <laughs> so, that was, but I will say he was, I think he was 10 or 15 years ahead with technology as well, because I remember a couple of times, somehow he had a laptop out, which I don't know what he was looking for on there, but he was looking for a plug on the airplane well before the, there was uh, such thing as Wi-Fi, probably 10 years before Wi-Fi came out. He's trying to plug it in and get in onto his emails. And everyone's like, Roy, what are you doing? He says, I'm just getting on my email. How Roy, how? <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing as Wi-Fi. So yeah, he had a couple of those. Um, but the, the good news is for him, he could catch a fish, couldn't he? He could catch a fish. Oh, yeah. Um, and that was, that's probably one of the, you know, when, when he did pass, that was one of my great regrets is that in the last sort of 10 years, just cause lives get busy. Mm. I didn't spend as many times with him on those fishing trips and he'd always send out an invite to come up and, um, he, I think he just got you up there to rough you up a bit and, you know, make sure you knew mm. you're a city boy, you know, getting through croc infested waters, hunting pigs and that sort of stuff was definitely not my game. Um, but, but you shit yourself in any of these? Oh yeah. He terrorized a big mate of mine, um, Brett Crichton, um, we, we were going and we were borrowing one of his mate's boats and it was in really shallow croc infested waters. And he, he, Roy did the, Roy did the head count and said, big fella, you're too heavy, get out. And my mate was oh. like, no way in the world am I getting out of here. And Roy goes, I'm not telling you twice, get out like that. And he's gone over near the, like the bank 
And he said, grab that tree. And my mate's given it a little, <laughs> oh, I missed it. <laughs> we go like down this, um, you know, creek bed, hitting the rocks all the way down. Oh. And, uh, Roy was absolutely livid because it wasn't his boat. And so he, mm. you know, he didn't want to wreck his mate's boat and, uh, he didn't, he never forgive my mate. <laughs> so there's the most cowardly act ever seen, in the, <laughs> ever seen up North. But, uh, but yeah, he brought us a lot of, lot of joy. And, um, he's another guy that he could get a duck and get belted everywhere and mm. he would be the life of the party after the win. And you know, that, that showed a lot about him You know, he'd celebrate as hard as anyone. Mm. Mm. You got a favorite Roy knock? Uh, it goes back to club cricket back before, um, yeah, anyone hit the ball like that. No, Roy mm. used to use a two pound two toothpick. I mean, God knows what, how far he'd hit it right. with the bats they've got today, but we played a game and Dirk Wellen was captain and this side set us a ridiculous chase in club cricket down at Kerrydale and Dirk's instructions were shut up shot. We're not going anywhere here. Like don't give him anything like this. And about. 40 minutes later, Roy hit 83 off 39 balls in the, in the club game and hit the biggest sixes you've ever seen and, and won the game from nowhere. And he's walked in and just walked past her and gave him a little smirk and said, sorry about that, Skip. But, uh, but the funny one, it was a bit like a movie, like the, right at the end, he hit this six and it, it had power lines running across it and it skipped along the power line and just got over this bloke's head for six and oh. yeah, got us the win. So that was probably one, but I mean, there's countless, I was absolutely Chuff when he got that big hundred in the, in the world cup against Pakistan. Yeah. yeah cause he'd copped so much grief, um, you know, leading into it and punter had backed him to go there cause he knew what he could do. Uh, and for me, that was his, that was his breakthrough and where he got a lot of belief and become such a great player for Australia. Maybe Moddy can get us Jimmy Ma. Yes. Could you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> wouldn't take much. A couple of beers for him. <laughs> <laughs> Just send him. Yeah. <laughs> He's even cheaper than me. <laughs> <laughs> what if we sent him Brett Lee's Sydney Beer Company? Uh, he hey, probably yeah. would look at that tin and throw it Sydney, as far as he uh, could get. Yeah, that that actually. It didn't does. have four X's on the front of it. I don't reckon. Jimmy is a. I think he is a um, ambassador for four X, which is the, ridiculous. Uh, really, ain't happening. Brett Lee's uh, beverage up there. Last one on Roy. Could he have played rugby league if he put his head to it? Uh, well, I think Wayne Bennett summed it up, didn't he? He said, as a, as a rugby league player, you make a great cricketer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I think he could have done anything, Roy. He was an amazing hockey player as well. Yep. Even his golf, you know, he didn't take it that seriously. But God, mm. if he hit the ball, um, good runner at school. Yeah, no, he's a good all round athlete. And I think he's the sort of bloke, if he got into it at the right age, yeah, he, he could have done anything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last one, just lastly here, Sam, you put it on the, uh, the rundown. The last one day where he played? Yeah. Netherlands versus Gloucestershire and Amsterdam. This is Motty, not Roy, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's yeah, that's my there? country. Yeah. How the hell did you end up there? That is a good story, actually. I So I I played a lot of league cricket in England and was coming to the end of my Shield career and the, the visa regula regulations changed quite a bit. So you had to be playing first class cricket to be there. In Holland, you didn't have to be there. So I, I went over there and played for a club um, in Rotterdam and yeah. Excelsior 20, it was called. Had a good season. It was all good fun. Went back and got the New South Wales assistance role. And so I couldn't, couldn't go back, but I already paid for my airfare. So I'll go and have a month <laughs> over in Holland. Why not? So turn turned up, no cricket gear, no nothing. And the rules of that, it was called the CNG trophy back in the day. And they were allowed one overseas player mm. because I'd done all right the year before. Emerson Trotman, who was the coach goes, do you want to have a game? I was like, yeah, why not? So I was in borrowed kit. Um, you know, we played these, uh, I think we played Gloucester and yeah. was it Gloucester and yeah, Somerset maybe, you, you or, or even Cornwall County yeah. maybe. Yeah. But the most impressive was my bowling figures. I think we got a two for didn't I? Did you? Yeah. I saw you bat, like, you're batting middle order. I thought, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> it was funny in Holland. They didn't, they always had the pros bat at, at four. I remember I wasn't a swashbuckler by any means, but I, I played my first game in Holland and whacked like 90 and they said, Oh, you can't bat like that. You need to bat in the middle and shore it all up. Oh, so yeah. yeah, that took a bit of the fun out of it. Fair enough. Well, mate, your assistant coach sixes this yes. season. Yeah. Looking yep. forward to that. Um, with Shippy. should be good. The BBL. And just to let you know, there might be a job going uh, on the West coast of Africa. Um, Ivory coast last week, some qualifiers in the African <laughs> region. I think it was, they played Sierra Leone and Nigeria and et cetera. This is their returns with the bat 21, seven. Yes, yeah, seven in reply to four for 271. Sticky. 21, 7, 31, 41, 26. Only ways up, isn't it? Powerball numbers <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Manus would take that. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, some returns like that at the moment. And we'd be happy for him yeah. if he is. 
Uh, Motti, thanks so much for Pleasure. the chat. Um, hopefully you've made a few headlines for us in the English press. <laughs> <laughs> See how we go with that one. Enjoy the summer. Good luck with the Sixers. Thanks very much, boys. Enjoyed thanks, it. Motti. Uh, Sammy, we're back later in the week with a comprehensive preview of the second test, correct? Correct, with Travis Head. Oh, oh nice. Yeah. Traveldino. Looking forward to that. Uh, that was Willow Talk today. Have a great week, everyone. Back later in the week. Yeah, thanks for watching the Willow Talk podcast on YouTube. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't have to miss an episode wherever you are. And while you're at it, check out these videos up here. They're mostly good.